Uh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, like Adam said, my talk is about FooCoach, which is a website that has services for software analysis, malware detection and vulnerability research. Uh, a little bit about myself to start off with though. Um, I'm a PhD student at Deakin University here in Melbourne. Uh, this is my third and final year um, in my PhD. I have to submit my thesis early next year. And the working title is Software Analysis, Similarity um, and Classification. So it covers a lot um, about what I'm talking about today. This is effectively my PhD research. Um, I'm also a book author. Earlier in the year I published a book um, in Springer, Software Similarity and Classification, which also overlaps a lot of this work as well. So software similarity and classification, uh, software analysis are all the things uh, that my web services uh, provide. Uh, so I look at uh, things like malware detection and malware attribution, and these are uh, examples of software uh, similarity, detecting malware variants and attributing uh, particular variants to, to known families and then identifying authors through that. And that's useful in things like incident uh, response uh, if you have a, a large number of samples, you want to identify which samples uh, are those that are important. Uh, you can use software similarity to group those samples into families, then you can identify whether a sample is related to a known family of malware or if a sample is something new. Um, and it enables you to, to, to triage uh, malware in a, in a more efficient way. Uh, software similarity is also useful in plagiarism detection. Uh, plagiarism detection is about detecting uh, s copying in students' uh, programming assignments. So software similarity can identify that, that the two uh, programming or assignments are similar to each other and therefore you know, theft has occurred. Um, in commercial uh, instances you have software theft detection which is all about detecting the illegitimate uh, copying of software code and software similarity can identify that as well. And finally um, um, related to my research, again, and stuff that I'll be talking about today is vulnerability research, uh, and that's basically the application of software analysis. Uh, so what my website offers uh, are three uh, research tools, uh, the academic research tools, and, and you can go to my website and, and have a look at them, have a play with them, uh, and it covers those things that I've talked about just now. So the outline of my talk, I'm, I'm going to talk about three services, like I said, SimSeer, which is a software similarity and visualisation tool to detect plagiarism detection or software theft or detect malware variants. Um, another tool that I'll be talking about is CloneWise, which is all about detecting uh, the reuse of, of library code and identifying vulnerabilities because of that reuse code, because often libraries go out of date uh, and you have vulnerable um, vulnerabilities that occur because of that. Uh, the third tool that I'll talk about is a tool called Bugwise, and that's uh, a bug detection system that works on binaries. Um, and I'll talk about that uh, a little later on. <coughs> I'll, then I'll talk about future work and conclude the presentation. So first I want to be talking about my software similarity service uh, known as SimSeer. There are lots of applications of software similarity and, and visualising um, samples that are similar to each other. Talked about that earlier on, things like malware detection. Malware variant detection is, is the classic example, plagiarism detection, software theft detection. And the reason why we need these types of tools as opposed to um, traditional um, signature-based methods is that traditional string signatures are really uh, ineffective. It's very easy to modify a program um, or to have a variant of a program that a string signature doesn't detect and doesn't detect the reuse of you know, a particular program structure. Um, modern fingerprints are effective, um, looking at different types of signatures, not based on strings, but program structure and so forth. They're effective, but in many cases, they're very slow and inefficient. So, you know, one, there are lots of ways that we can represent programs and, and some of the classic ways that we can represent programs are what I've shown here, which is the control flow of a program. Control flow represents the possible execution paths of a program. And on the left I've got a, a control flow graph uh, belonging to a single procedure. And in the control flow graph we have basic blocks in each node in the graph. And a basic block consists of a sequence, a straight line sequence of instruction instructions without an intervening uh, control flow transfer instruction. Um, the edges between the basic block, block blocks represent that control flow may um, follow that particular path. So uh, control flow is an intra-procedural, it, it's control flow, uh, the control flow graph is control flow within a procedure 
On the right is a call graph or a function call graph, and that represents the possible control flow between procedures. So in, in this graph, uh, each node is a procedure, uh, and an edge between uh, the nodes represents that one of the procedures calls the other procedure. So in the example I've shown, PROC0 calls PROC1 and PROC1 calls PROC4 and so forth. So in CMC, which is my software similarity and visualisation service, uh, I use the set of control flow graphs. So there is one control flow graph per procedure, and each program has many procedures. Uh, so on the, exact, the, the figure that I've shown here, on the right is a, prog a program, which is effectively a set of procedures, and each procedure has one control flow graph associated with it. So I'll just show a, a small demo of um, uh, some software that I've written that, that visualises um, these types of program representations, and you can get a, a visual uh, depiction of what I'm talking about. Hopefully the demo guides will play nice to me. I've heard there have been some, some, some um, unfortunate incidents um, occurring, and the demo guides have locked my screen. So this is just looking at um, bin echo on a Linux system. Um, and if we go to the program functions and we show the call graph, and there's one call graph per program, represents the interprocedural control flow. Um, what we can see here is it's a disconnected graph. That is, uh, we can see that this particular part of the graph is not connected to this part or this part. And that simply means that some of the control flow wasn't um, able to be analysed directly because probably of dynamic dispatches, uh, which is making a control flow call um, based on data which you can't figure out statically. But if you just look at the call graph um, and include all those disconnected components, you can get a pretty good representation. So if we click on one of the nodes, we can get a control flow graph. Uh, and the control flow graph, again, represents that intra-procedural control flow. And we can, we can see that there's, it's quite a large graph, this one. And each node is a basic block. Each, and, and each basic block consists of a sequence of instructions without an intervening control flow transfer instruction. Um, in the graph that I've shown here today, um, I'm using um, each basic block consists of instructions in an intermediate language, and that's what the SimSea service does internally. It transforms x86 code into an intermediate language, um, and that makes some of the analysis a little easier to look at. So that's basically some program representations that we can use and what SimSea uses internally. Remember, it uses a set of control flow graphs, and uh, not just the core graph. So SimSea does more than just look at control flow graphs. Uh, it uses aspects uh, of decompilation. So on the left, we have a control flow graph, remember, coming from a procedure. And in the middle, we've decompiled that control flow graph into uh, what's known as a structured representation. Uh, it's basically very similar to source code. Uh, we've got iteration, conditional statements, and, and so forth. Uh, and then this. Uh, this serialised string representation is tokenized to give us a string. So this is what SimSea does internally to, to every control flow graph and how it works internally to, to find program similarity and, and software visualisation. So we, we don't just stop there. We take those decompiled control flow graphs that are now represented as strings um, and we extract all possible fixed size substrings uh, from, that, from those strings, from that set of strings, one for each procedure. Uh, and these substrings are known as Q grams. We take the 500 most dominant Q grams uh, from a training set, uh, and you can see on the bottom there, that's, that's on the left is what we start off with just one string, and then we take all the substrings of a particular size. In this example, the, subs, the size of the substrings is four. All possible substrings is a sliding window, and we get those Q grams. So we, we use uh, what's known as a feature vector. We take from our program that we're looking at the uh, 500 Q grams that we've, uh, those dominant Q grams that we've trained earlier. Um, and these Q grams make a feature vector. And we can use things like vector distance to show the similarity or distance between programs. So we can use things like the Euclidean distance, which is effectively 
um, the, the distance between two points in n-dimensional space. We can consider our feature vector, in fact, a point in n-dimensional space, and the, and the straight line joining those points, the distance of that is the Euclidean distance. So distance tells us effectively how dissimilar two programs are, or two points are, or two vectors are. The, the closer the distance, the more similar they are. The further the distance, the less similar they are. And that is effectively how SIMC determines if two programs are similar to each other by converting the program into those strings and taking the Qgrams of those strings and constructing a feature vector and then using vector distance to show similarity uh, or dissimilarity. One of the things that we can uh, you know, build on that is using a software similarity search. So instead of just looking at how similar two programs are, looking at how similar uh, one program is to our database of programs. So uh, the, the, the figure that I've shown here, each black dot represents a query to our, to our database, and each grey dot represents uh, an object in our database. So what we want to know is what are our nearest neighbours or any neighbours to our query that are within a specific distance, and that tells us that these programs are variants of, of our query. They're very similar um, to our query, so they are program variants. So that's basically the theory of how um, this web service works. Um, the web service is on my 3CodeChu uh, web page. Um, you have a landing page and you can submit um, a zip archive uh, of binaries um, and it will analyse those binaries and tell you how similar they are to each other and then um, visualise uh, those program relationships. So in the example that I've shown here, and I'll show a live demo in a sec, um, the example I've shown here, we've got an evolutionary tree uh, showing how similar each sample is to each other. The closer the samples are in the tree, the more similar they are. It's very much like a tree of life. Um, and on the bottom we have a similarity matrix showing a, like a quantitative description of how similar each program is. Uh, when the samples are in green, it means that those two programs on the X and Y axis are variants of each other. So I'll show a demo of this. Um, so this, is, this isn't the actual website, this is just a local copy of it, so it's not as, as visually attractive, the HTML at least, um, to the web service, but um, it, it's a good example of how it works. So I actually have um, a zip archive uh, of about nine or ten uh, malware samples and some ASCII text in there just to show that, that the ASCII text is very different than everything else, but it only really works on program executables, so it just won't be able to analyse that ASCII text. And we've got the CLES family of malware here, which is one sort of family of malware, and we've got the NetSky family of malware here. So we can submit that to the, to the service, and we submit that. It takes, takes a little bit of time to run, not too long, um, probably about 30 seconds to actually finish processing. If you're using the, the web service, um, you might get queued um, depending on how many people are using the web service at once. Um, it's not a great, but lots of white space on that HTML, but we see a, a visualisation of our program relationships. So the CLES family of malware uh, is all up here and that's easily identified as one family. So clays.h and clays.g are actually very, very similar to each other. If we look down at our similarity matrix, we can see that clays.h is 94% similar to, to clays.g, which is very similar. Also, the NetSky uh, malware family is shown on the left, and that's a distinct family that we can identify. Uh, when the, um, the similarity matrix shows a red, um, cell, it basically means that it wasn't able to be processed, so the ASCII text wasn't able to process similarity with any other programs. So that's the, that's, that's the end of uh, the SimSeer demo. That's, and that's pretty much the web service that you're getting. You, you can submit um, up to 10 samples per zip file to the web service, and there is a limitation on how many, um, how many samples you can submit per day just to keep my processing costs down, um, and it's free to use. Um, in the future, I'd like to 
I have implemented more types of program representations and more types of fingerprints over the years, but I have not made these accessible yet. So it would be nice in the future um, if I could provide an option to the user to say what type of similar, what type of program features or program representation the server should use, and also to use different types of similarity measures. You can I've talked about like Euclidean distance and Manhattan distance before, but there are lots of these types of um, distances or similarity measures that you can use, such as the cosine similarity and so forth. So in summary of this particular part of the talk, um, SimSeri is pretty effective. It works pretty well. It, it, it can actually unpack malware as well, but it doesn't unpack um, everything. I can also um, pass process dumps, although I haven't pushed that aspect of the service out to the, to the web server yet, but my internal version works quite well, and I'll, I'll do that shortly. Um, but for process dumps, it's actually you know, quite effective and could be a, a useful tool for analysts um, who have samples on, on what, or want to perform incident response. Um, the service is efficient. Um, using vectors is a, is a very good way of comparing programs. Vector distances and vector similarities are very fast compared to things like the graph edit distance, which is very slow. Uh, the web service is free for public use, so I encourage people to have a look at it. So that's the end of the first service that, that, that I'm presenting today. Um, the second service that I'm presenting is a tool called uh, CloneWise. Um, and CloneWise is all about detecting package clones and inferring security problems. Uh, why, what exactly am I talking about when I say that? Well, developers sometimes embed or clone software from third-party sources. Um, that is, they sometimes maintain an internal copy of a library in, 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 a, in a source, or they fork a library. The classic example uh, is Firefox. I talked about this actually last year at RuxCon, uh, but I've changed all the approach. So this is actually the same motivation for, for doing this, but the, all the work is completely new. Um, so yeah, the classic example are things like Firefox, uh, which embeds libpng. Uh, and and the, 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 the thing with that is that um, when libpng gets a vulnerability, Firefox is most likely vulnerable as well. So you need to update um, libpng in Firefox every time there's a vulnerability. So the tool that I've got is called CloneWise, and it detects if two packages share code. So the question is, does Firefox share code with libpng? And the answer is yes, they both have uh, common code. Uh, the other problem that CloneWise solves um, is, is one package entirely embedded in another. So Firefox isn't embedded in libpng, but libpng is embedded in Firefox. And the, the figure that I've shown indicates how we think of vulnerabilities. Uh, there are a set of libpng vulnerabilities and a set of Firefox vulnerabilities. And libpng vulnerabilities are almost a complete subset uh, of the Firefox vulnerabilities. So how do I actually uh, perform this type of analysis? How do I detect if two packages share code or if one package is completely embedded in another? I use a, thing, uh, I use a set of features uh, that are obtained from those two packages. So the features that I'm looking at include such things as the number of file names in each package and also the number of common file names that are shared between packages. So there might be a file called libpng.c and that file name might be present in the Firefox source and the libpng source. I talked about this last year, so, but I've also included other types of features as well. Um, each um, file might also have a similar fuzzy hash, and that's another type of feature that we look at. Um, also, each file has a weight associated with it. For example, files like readme or makefile occur in almost every source package um, in, in, a, in a Linux distribution. Uh, so what we can do is we can weight those file names based on how frequent that file name occurs in the repository. So readme occurring in almost every package is weighted very, very low. So we've got, from the previous slide, about 26, 28, less than 30 types of features. What can we do with these features? Well, like SimSeer, we can consider these features n-dimensional points in space. Um, and then we can use uh, what machine learning offers is classification. And classification basically assigns classes to objects. Uh, so the types of classes that we're looking at here is given two packages, 
does one package share code with another, yes or no? So it's a binary classification problem, as they say. Uh, there are different ways of implementing classification algorithms. There are linear classifiers, which effectively builds uh, a linear separation or a hyperplane, as they say, between two points in space where one set of points refers to one class and another set of points refers to another class. There are nonlinear classifiers where that, that hyperplane is replaced with a nonlinear function and it's a curve in space. And there are also things like decision trees, which are uh, known as piecewise linear uh, classifiers. So that was the shared package clone detection, that I, the, the feature set that I talked about before, if one package shares code with another package. But if we want to know if one package is completely embedded in another package, we have to look at a different set of features. So the types of features that I'm looking at here are, again, the number of file names in each package. Um, for example, uh, if a library probably has less files than the, the, than the package that it's embedded in. So that's one type of feature that we look at. Another type of feature that we look at is how much of one package in terms of file names are embedded in the other package as a percentage. Uh, for example, we would expect the library that's embedded in, the packa in another package to have a different ratio. Uh, another type of feature that we're looking at is does the package name um, have a prefix of lib, which is, a, which is sort of an odd feature, but if you think about it, libraries often have prefixes of lib in their package name, for, for example, libpng uh, and so forth. Um, also, another interesting type of feature is how many package dependencies um, depend on this particular package that we're looking at. So, uh, for example, libpng, there are lots of packages that depend on it. But for Firefox, almost no packages depend on it. So that's another indicator that one package is probably the library that is being embedded in the other package. So that's, that's basically how the system works. I use machine learning, I use classifiers, I construct feature vectors um, and use features to do that. Uh, when we have that information and we know what packages are embedded in other packages, we can, do, we can do some cool things with that. We can, for example, detect copyright violations. So we, if we identify our embedded package clones and we extract the license information of each package and distros like Debian, in fact, include licensing information for every package. What we can do is for every GPL license embedded package clone, we check that it isn't being embedded in a BSD or permissively licensed package, uh, because that's actually a, a GPL violation. So we can do that, and we can search um, Linux distros for copy, copyright violations of GPL and BSD license code. I, I did that for, um, for Debian, but I did not actually find any copyright violations, which is good for Debian, I think, and demonstrates that they actually you know, make a significant effort in, in, in you know, keeping GPL, GPL code. Uh, another thing which I got better results on, the, the licensing, I, th I was hoping to find some, some copyright, life, copyright violations, but fortunately I didn't. Um, but in the automated vulnerability inference, inference we did find uh, several vulnerabilities. So we take a CVE or a vulnerability report, we match that to a Debian package name, uh, we pass the CVE summary and extract the vulnerable file. Now, most CVE summaries include, for example, I'll say that package libpng is vulnerable in the function libpng read.c um, read or something like that. Uh, and then we find clones of the package. We find where that libpng is embedded elsewhere with that similar file name, um, and we check that Debian is tracking this vulnerability. So that's sort of the ex high level, that's sort of the explanation. It can be quite sort of complex to look at it just in one slide, but the way that we can use this tool um, is by, a, uh, for example, what we've shown here, we've, we've got a CVE description, we've got a CVE and a vulnerability for libpng. Um, we can run our tool called CloneWise and we can query our embedded cache and say, are there any packages that embed libpng? And libpng is embedded in the package IA32-libs, um, and it's been, it's not fixed at the moment by Debian. And in fact, IA32-libs has uh, a lot of bugs in it. Um, it's basically a, a package that embeds lots of software, and they only update this package on point releases. They don't um, update any of the vulnerable, up, up, do patches for any of the vulnerabilities that occur, so it always has vulnerabilities against it. Uh, but in the new version of Debian, uh, the unstable version of Debian, they've, they've replaced that with another system, so it'll avoid these problems. So uh, we can actually run the tool 
um, with particular CVEs and it will report to us um, if there are any outstanding CVEs that we should be interested in. So I run the tool again uh, called CloneWise with the arguments bind bugs, given it a CVE for a libpng vulnerability, and it tells us that libpng is cloned in the package ia32libs and Debian isn't tracking in their database of vulnerabilities uh, this particular vulnerability. So you may, may be vulnerable and is certainly deserving of, of more attention. So that's sort of the, basically the features of the tool. Uh, one of the things I did is, as, as sort of most researchers do is evaluate the system of how accurate the, the package clone detection was and so forth. So I, I tested a number of machine learning classification algorithms, um, you know, using those feature sets, using those feature vectors, um, but using labelled data. Uh, Debian Linux have a manually created database of uh, embedded packages, so we can use this uh, to verify uh, how accurate this tool is. Uh, the best result that I got was um, about a 70% true positive rate, so I detected 70% of the label data that Debian had with a 0.11% false positive rate. Uh, I, can, I, try, I thought the false positive rate was slightly too high um, for sort of wide scale use. So I, improved, I increased the decision threshold, which decreased the true positive rate to about 59%, but also decreased that false positive rate to 0.03%, which is, which is really good. I think it's a practical tool. The embedded clone detection, so that detected if two packages shared code, this actually detects if one package is completely embedded in another package, and the true positive rate was around 92% uh, and a false positive rate of about 7%. Uh, these are some of the bugs um, that are reported. These have not all been verified yet, but um, reports have been made to Debian, and they've reported some of them have, you know, are clearly bugs. Um, and some of them uh, are false positive. For example, the i 32 libs package has you know, you know, tens and tens of bugs in it that have not been patched. So I'll just show a quick demo uh, of this. It's just on command line. The web, there's a web service that you can interface with, but I'll just show the command line tool. It's open source, so you can run this at home as well. So this is, um, we're just going to look at a, um, at a CVE for an open um, JPEG vulnerability that occurred a couple of months ago. Um, open JPEG 1.5 um, allows a denial of service or possible code execution. Um, so it's a recent vulnerability and the question is, are there any packages in Debian that embed open JPEG? So, so we can run the tool. Uh, we're going to query for embedded uh, libraries. Um, is anything in the in the in fact in the Debian repository that embeds OpenJPEG? And we run the tool. And this is a pre-built cache actually of, of data. To build the cache, I had to run it on an Amazon cluster, and it was took quite a time. But this is the pre-built cache, and what we see is that OpenJPEG is embedded in the package free image. Um, Debian know about this package, They're, it's in their manually created database, um, but it hasn't been fixed. So they know about it, but they haven't fixed it. Um, so it's probably worth investigating to see if OpenJPEG is actually vulnerable in this package free image. If we look at what packages Debian don't know about um, that aren't tracked manually in their database, we can see that OpenJPEG is in the package blender, but in fact they use the dynamic library to do this, it's been fixed, but they, they don't Normally they're meant to report about these things as basically a report trying to justify why it thinks that those two packages, why OpenJPEG is embedded in Insight Toolkit. And this is quite convincing that OpenJPEG.c um, is present in the package OpenJPEG and it's embedded in the Insight Toolkit as well. And these are the weights that I was talking about before. Um, so CRC.c, very common I suppose, and it has a low weight of four but openjpeg.c, probably less, less common, has a higher weight. So that's the tool. Yeah, so basically I took, um, for, for Debian Ubuntu, took the entire source repo, uh, built, uh, built a database from it, 
um, and then uh, used uh, some of the, manu the manually created uh, uh, um, embedded database for this for this part where it says the, pack, the clone is being tracked by Debian, and that's from the security tracker. But in summary, I took the entire um, the repo, source repo, unpacked every package, and then built a database from that. You, you can do two things. You can do a dynamic query where it queries the database directly, or you can build a cache where every package of interest is, is queried previously and then stored in a cache. And that, because it does take a few minutes to run, um, for a query that isn't cached. So it's easy to cache all the results and then you know, do it at major releases or point releases. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the tool, that's the tool. And, and Debian, Debian are, are, are planning to integrate it into, again, it's, it's been going on for a while now, but we're, we're still working with them to integrate it into infrastructure and have it used by the security team so every time a vulnerability comes out to actually scan um, the repo and find embedded packages and look at what vulnerabilities need to be fixed. I'd also like to um, do binary level clone detection. So this work looks at source code um, only. It doesn't look at the binaries. It just looks at source code. Um, so it would be nice, um, and I'm sure there's tons of vulnerabilities in, in Windows, for example. Um, yeah, and again, would like the Linux security teams to use this, so not just Debian, but other, other teams as well. So in, in summary, for this particular part of the talk, um, what I've provided is practical clone detection at a, at a, at a package level uh, for Linux, and it improves the manual-only tracking that, you know, that, that Debian currently does, and most distros don't even track this, these things at all. So Debian is, in fact, one of the few distros that have a a database that is actively maintained and you can submit things to it and improve it. Um, the tool has actually found a number of bugs um, and Debian have been pretty good about fixing them um, and Ubuntu as well and Red Hat in the past. Um, it's an open source project so you can download it. It's on my GitHub. Uh, and I've also provided a web service where you submit a tar of all of your source and it can compare a database that, that's already been um, extracted from the repos. So that's the end of that tool. That's the second uh, main tool that I'm providing. Um, the third tool is a tool called Bugwise. Um, and this is about detecting bugs in binaries using decompilation and data flow analysis. So there's lots of motivations for why uh, we should be doing um, binary analysis and bug detection on binaries. Uh, you know, we don't always have access to source code. So binary level analysis is very useful. A uh, classic example is black box uh, penetration testing. Uh, you know, black box testers, pen testers, typically, well, they don't always have access to the source code. Sometimes they do, but a lot of the time they're just given a, a you know, within their scope to, you know, to not to do a black box test. Um, also, when we do think of things like external audits and compliance testing, it might you know, we don't always want to give our auditors access to our source code. We just want validation that, 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 that what we have is, is reasonably compliant. And we want to assure also third-party software. If we're using um, external software, we would like to know that it's not, you know, bug-ridden and full of holes. Uh, finally, if we think of the compiler itself, um, the compiler modifies the source code or translates the source code into a binary representation. Link editing does the same thing. So we would like to verify that the compiler and the linker are actually doing what they're intended to do. So the first thing um, to do this, to do this type of analysis, is to convert x86 code into, uh, into an intermediate language. I showed, if you remember, the, binal, the binalized demo from the very first demo where I showed basic blocks of intermediate language. This is the intermediate language that I'm talking about. x86 is complex and big. There are several hundred instructions. Um, and each instruction has side effects uh, and non-standard ways of, of, of operating. So the intermediate language that I use is called WIRE, and it's a low-level risk assembly style language has a small set of instructions, very standardized, no side effects in the instructions. And that's lifted from, from x86 assembly code. One of the sort of the interesting things um, is that I have formally defined semantics. And semantics are mathematical ways of representing the meaning of programs. 
Um, and when we do this, we have we can we can formally reason about programs. So we can show, for example, that two um, snippets of code might be equivalent if we def if we show that they are that their semantics are equivalent. Um, in Bugwise, the tool that I'm talking about now, um, it's all about detecting bugs in binaries. Uh, and to do this, we need to decompile um, variables, local variables, and local variables are stored on the stack. Um, they're often referenced uh, relative to the stack pointer or the frame pointer, and to in we need to know what the, frame, the stack pointer is to decompile these local variables. So one way we can do this is by estimating uh, the stack pointer um, in and out of a basic block and representing the changes to the stack pointer by a set of linear inequalities. Uh, and then we can pass it to a linear programming solver and, and, and that can tell us what the stack pointer is at various program points. Uh, this was actually yeah, done by the hex rays decompiler um, some years ago uh, and this was their, me their method that they, that they u that used then and they still use now I think. Um, I also, they, they solve the linear programming problem by an algorithm known as the simplex method, which is one of the classic ways of solving linear programming problems. So we need to decompile our programs to recover local variables. And those local variables, again, are based relative to the stack pointer. So once we know the stack pointer, we can recover local variables. Um, and when we decompile these local variables, we replace those memory references with native variables in our intermediate language. So the code on the left I've shown is the original uh, code before decompilation, and the code on the right is the decompiled version. It's not the classic form of decompilation where you're going from binary to source code, but it's a, in this example, it's recovering high-level information from a binary level uh, source. So, we've done our decompilation, we've recovered local variables. What we want to do is we want to reason about those local variables and their data. So that leads us to data flow analysis. And a classic data flow analysis is known as reaching definitions. A reaching definition is a definition of a variable that reaches a program point without being redefined. So in the example that I've shown here, we have two definitions at the top, x equals 1 and y equals 3. And then we have a definition in the middle left, x equals 2. So if you look at the bottom part of the graph, we have three definitions that reach it. We have two definitions that, that reach it from the top via the right-hand side, and we have that mid-left definition that reaches it as well via the left-hand side. So we have three reaching definitions at that program point. There are more, there are other types of data flow analysis problems. There are things like upward exposed usage, ex upward exposed uses, which basically tells us um, all the uses of a definition uh, subsequent to a program point. So it's basically the, the dual of reaching definitions. We also have um, what some people might know as live variable analysis. And a variable is live if it will subsequently be read without being redefined. Uh, and we also have things like reaching copies, which is the reach of a copy statement. This is used in, in compiler optimization, such as copy propagation. There are also other analyses that you can look at, such as available expressions and very busy expressions. Um, but I generally don't use that, those types of analyses for this, for this work. So that leads me on to what bugs I'm trying to detect. Um, the first bug class that I'm looking at um, is unsafe applications of the get end of library call. This is basically copying an environment variable into a buffer of a small, you know, of a, of a finite size. Um, and so the classic example is if you have an example such as str copy with get end as an argument, it's probably buggy. They're probably not doing any bounds checking on it. So to detect those types of bugs in a, in a binary, what we do is for each library call get end, if the return value is live, that is the return value is going to be used, and it's the reaching definition to the second argument to string copy, that is the second argument to string copy is the environment variable from get end, then we warn. It's, it's a very old bug, it's, it's certainly, it's an old school bug. So the next type of bug that I'm looking at is use after free detection. Uh, so for each free of a pointer, if the pointer is live, then we warn. So that's a very simple way of using data flow analysis to detect use after free bugs. Double free detection is an extension of that approach. 
uh, for each free of a pointer, if the upward exposed use of pointer's definition is free pointer, that is, if the next use of that pointer is in a free pointer, then we warn. So I, I looked at, at these bugs and I, and I tried to do an evaluation. Used use of pointer's definition is free pointer, that is, if the next use of that pointer is in a free pointer, then we warn. So I, I looked at, at these bugs and I, and I tried to do an evaluation and tried to find some real bugs. So I took the entire Debian 7 unstable repository. It was about 123,000 ELF binaries and I scanned them for, for get end bugs. And I've had about 85 uh, bug reports in 47 packages. So I've shown the bug, the packages on the, on the right hand side. Uh, most of these are, are true. There are some false positives and I haven't gone through the entire list to, to weed out all false positives. But I say about 80% are, are actual true positives. So one thing that I did, I took this data and I sort of visualised it a little bit. Um, so I accumulated all the get end bugs over time as I scanned more and more binaries. And I sorted that by the size of the binary. So the idea was, I had this idea that the bigger the binary, the more likely a bug was going to occur, which is sort of a pretty common idea for most people. Um, and I wanted to, sh you know, if that was actually the case, um, then what you should see is a non-linear curve. If it was a linear uh, growth, then you would have a constant number of bugs found um, irrespective of binary size as you scan more binaries. But in fact, we have a non-linear growth, um, but it's almost linear. So what we're saying probably is that for this particular class of bugs, then file size has a little bit of impact on how many bugs you find, but not a great deal of impact, which is sort of interesting. I think if you look at other types of bugs, such as use after freeze or double freeze, you're probably going to have more bugs um, as the binary sizes get bigger. Uh, so one of the, another thing that I looked at was the statistics of the get end uh, bugs. So the probability of a binary being vulnerable in the Debian repo was about 0.0006% or 7%. Um, so it's quite low. The probability of a package being vulnerable, a bit higher, 0.002%. An interesting thing though, what is the probability of a package having a second vulnerability given that one binary in it is already vulnerable. And that's over 50%. So it settles us that if we want to find more bugs, um, it's, it's easier to, to take a package that we know is vulnerable and look for other binaries in the same package for, for bugs, rather than just randomly scanning new binaries. So I'll show you just a, a quick demo. Of, it, it doesn't really d explain anything more than, than what I've shown. Okay, so this is uh, just running bugwise against uh, a program that's found in Debian 6 right now. It's, it's in, the, in the stable repository. This is a SecGroup ID games program called Zonix. And we run the tool, and it doesn't take too long to run. And what it tells us is that it's run the double free checker, and it's believed to have found a double free with the EIP, with the program counter at this address for the first free, and the program counter at that address uh, for the second free. So it's only taken a few seconds to run. And we can see that actually in this Group ID games program in Debian 6, we have a free here. And we have our second free being a double free right here. And the double free occurs uh, when the high score file name can't be opened. So it has actually found uh, a bug uh, in this binary. Um, in the future, I mean, that's, that pretty much summarises that particular um, service. As a web service, you can submit small binaries. It's only very small binaries to the web service because it does use up a bit of processing power in my box. But you can submit binaries to it um, to detect double freeze and other types of bugs. Um, but in the future, I'd like to do other types of analysis. I've done some simple types of data flow analysis, but there are other techniques that can be used, such as context-sensitive, <coughs> Interprocedural analysis, pointer analysis, and so forth. 
I'd also like to improve the decompilation components. It's not quite as robust as it should be. Um, I'd also like to analyse more bug classes. I have implemented other bug classes, but uh, I haven't had... The, the, the false positives are currently been a bit too high that I, I don't want to talk about it at this point, but I think in the future I'll have more bug classes implemented. So, you know, the summary of BugWise is it's a practical tool to find simple bugs. Um, it's based on, on reasonable theory. It has, it comes from a, a solid background of data flow analysis and static analysis. Um, it's extensible. Um, there's lots of work to do in the future and the web service is free to use. So those are my, my three web services that, I've, that, that I have available on my website. Um, in the future, I'd like to make more of my research public or at least accessible. Um, I'd also like to improve the back end of my services. It's, it's not running on very powerful hardware at the moment, um, so it could certainly be improved. Um, and I'd also like people to use the services. Um, I don't have a, a, a huge, huge base. <coughs> I don't have a huge uh, user base at the moment. So I would like to improve the number of people that use it. So in conclusion for this talk, um, all of the tools in this talk are public um, and free to use. Um, if you go to my website, you can see um, the services and other stuff. You can get the uh, wiki on software similarity and classification where I talk about academic papers and the reviews of those. I also have a preprint of my book available, uh, the, the books that I talked about earlier on software similarity and classification, or you can buy the book from Springer. And that concludes uh, my presentation. Are there any questions? <laughs>